Welcome back to another lesson as part of the AP Psychology course. This is lesson number 14 on the visual system. This presentation is mostly going to present parts of the eye as well as processes that take place that are part of the visual system. So let's go ahead and dig right in. First we have the stimulus which is going to be light and here we have some properties of light and then the related perception. So you have amplitude, wavelength, purity, and saturation. In light, amplitude generally refers to the brightness, wavelength to the hue or the color. And you should know that color is a psychological experience. There is not really something known as color. Uh, purity, which is saturation, and saturation is going to refer to the amount of white in a color. So generally the more saturation it has, the uh, bolder, brighter it's going to look. So uh, the eye itself really has two main purposes. So one of those purposes is to provide a house for the neural tissue that receives light. This is known as the retina. And it also is going to channel light onto the retina. And so uh, the place where light first enters the eye is nicknamed the window at the front of the eye. This is called the cornea. And the part of the eye that is going to focus that light this is called the lens, and this is the transparent eye structure that's going to focus light rays that will fall into the retina. Now, the process that the lens is going to undergo is something known as accommodation. And this is when the lens actually adjusts or curves itself to alter visual focus. So uh, some of you who are watching this may be considered nearsighted or farsighted. And so uh, if you happen to be nearsighted, or uh, maybe you just have normal vision, you could actually take this test over here. So a normal person, a normal person is going to actually see Albert Einstein. However, if it's a nearsighted person, they're going to see Marilyn Monroe. Now, if you want to know exactly how that works, then just distance yourself a bit, and then you should be able to see it change before you. So the lens of the eye is actually going to adjust itself through the process of accommodation to try to uh, help focus light on the retina. But some people suffer from either nearsightedness or farsightedness. So if you're nearsighted, you can remember this by saying, uh, near is clear, far is hard. This means that a nearsighted person is not really going to have any problems reading a book, but if they're driving in their car and trying to read signs from a distance, it's going to be pretty difficult. Farsightedness, on the other hand, basically means that up close, someone really struggles, but from a distance, they can view things pretty easily. Within part of your eye, you have two components, the iris and the pupil although really the pupil is kind of like an absence of something but the uh, iris is a colored ring of muscle that's going to control the size of your pupil and so you may have a dilated pupil or you may have a constricted pupil the pupil when I said earlier it's an absence it's really an opening in your eye you don't normally think of this as the opening you just kind of think of it as that black dot but it's really not a black dot so it's going to be a hole in your eye and it's going to regulate uh, the amount of light that goes through it. Now the way it's going to regulate that is because that hole consists of space between the iris or where all the muscles are going to control that pupil. And so if your eye is going to be constricted then that means the hole is going to be really really small. The pupils are uh, really tightened. However if they're more relaxed then the, uh, the muscles of the iris are now being dilated. And so in this case, you can take a look at the picture and see the difference between a constricted and a dilated pupil. It's creepy looking. Two more parts of the eye that you want to know, and probably the most important part of the eye is known as the retina. And the retina is basically an extension of neural tissue, so brain tissue, that lines the inside back surface of the eye. Its three main functions are to absorb light, process images, and then send that visual information to the brain. The way it's going to do that is through the place known as the optic disc. The optic disc is actually a hole in the retina where optic nerve fibers are going to be allowed to exit the eye. If for some reason you don't have an optic disc, then chances are it's impossible for you to have uh, optic nerves running and connecting to the retina. You can look at this picture here and see the, uh, the box square. Right there is where the optic disc is going to be. Your eye is home to a bunch of different visual receptors, being rods and cones. As you can see, the rods greatly outnumber the cones, nearly 125 million to about 5 million. So your cones are mostly going to be useful for daylight vision and color vision. And one spot particularly that has nothing but cones is known as the fovea. And the fovea is a tiny spot in the center of the retina 
that not only contains cones, but gives you the greatest sense of sharpness and precise detail. This is called visual acuity. The rods, on the other hand, deal more with black and white vision, night vision, and peripheral vision. Primarily, the sides of your eye are going to be lined with the rods. This is what's going to allow you to have an exceptional peripheral vision and usually detect things before you can actually detect what color they are. Two processes that your eye undergoes are called dark and light adaptation. So dark adaptation is going to be when your eye is more sensitive to light and a low illumination. And this would be when you're entering the movie theaters, typically your eyes are going to go through dark adaptation. There's not supposed to be a whole lot of light in the movie theater, so your eye is much more sensitive to that. As a result, your eyes are probably going to dilate in order to let more light pass through the pupil. This is what also may bother you in a completely dark setting and somebody suddenly flashes on their phone's light and suddenly it seems super bright. It's because your eyes have dilated to let more light in, so they're more sensitive. However, when you leave the movie theater, you experience light adaptation. And this is now when your eye is less sensitive to light in a high illumination. When you leave the movies after just sitting in a dark theater and you haven't really adjusted your eyes yet, the first thing you do when you go outside is you go, oh, it's so bright, and you cover your eyes. This is because your eyes are still dilated and need to go back to normal in order to not let so much light in, mostly because there's a lot more light. This is all assuming, of course, you leave the movie theater while it's still light outside. So I would recommend that you really understand how exactly the visual process is going to take place. And so really, if you're ever receiving a question that looks for it in a specific order, then uh, these next two slides are really going to help you. So you have a series of bipolar cells. These are specialized neurons that are going to connect the rods and cones to the ganglion cells. So if we start from the beginning, you basically have the retina. Lining the retina are rods and cones. The rods and cones connect to the bipolar cells, which then connect to the ganglion cells, which will then connect to the optic nerve, which is then going to connect to the brain. And from there, we are basically going to transmit stuff that we see. Okay, so like I just said on the previous slide, looking at the visual process is going to be really important here. So within that retina, which is the uh, red area shaded here as the back part of the eye's lining, you have those rods and cones. So this diagram is really just focusing on what's on the retina and then connecting to the optic nerve. So the picture is really going to go from right to left. So you have the orange and yellow part, the rods and cones. Those are connected to the uh, tealish bipolar cells which are then connected to the blue ganglion cells, which then connect to the optic nerve and go to the brain. And that is basically the visual process. Now, within the brain, uh, information is going to have a crossing point to reach different brain hemispheres. This space is called the optic chasm, and this is the inner nerve crossing point for the eye's opposite brain hemisphere. Once information reaches the optic chasm, it may travel two different pathways. One pathway is called the LGN, or the lateral geniculate nucleus, and this is going to process visual signals for the thalamus, so this will include things such as color, form, contrast, or motion, or it's going to travel down the superior colliculus, which is going to be more involved for the perception of motion, as well as coordinating your visual input with other senses, maybe like movement if you need to dodge something that's headed your way. There are some Nobel Prize winners, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, and these guys basically find that there are specific neurons that are going to respond in a very uh, complex manner, but specifically selectively to th certain things. So remember this as SAM I am, SAM for shapes, angles, and movements. So basically, in our brain, in the visual cortex, we have certain things that our brain is going to selectively respond to. This is movement, this is angles, this is shapes, and a collection of other things. But ultimately, um, these guys win a Nobel Prize for discovering this, which is called feature detectors. Also, we have two streams, the ventral and dorsal stream, one which processes the what type details, such as forms and colors, whereas the dorsal stream processes the where details, such as motion or depth. So make sure that you're familiar with those. And finally, we are going to break down how exactly we view the world in color. And so color is a combination of wavelength and amplitude and purity, However, color itself does not actually exist. It is a psychological phenomenon based on how we interpret the reflection of light. And so different wavelengths are going to have 
essentially for us in our brain's sake different colors and so we can actually make new colors you have subtractive color mixing which is when you remove some wavelengths leaving less light than there was originally there and thus getting uh, the black or additive color mixing where we superimpose white light in order to actually get a bunch of new colors now our ability to actually detect lots of different color combinations can be attributed to the young Helmholtz theory of color vision also known as the trichromatic or the three color theory of color vision and they basically argued that since humans have three types of receptors sensitive to red green or blue which make up the primary colors we can basically combine these and get tons and tons of different colors now unfortunately there is about one out of fifty people who suffer from some form of color blindness or color deficiency and this is when they have an inability to distinguish among colors generally it affects males a lot more than females as it is something that is sex linked however uh, females can also experience some color blindness or color deficiencies as well so uh, the most common form of color blindness is when someone is considered a dichromat or someone who is making do with only two types of color receptors it's a lot more rare for someone to actually perceive the world in grayscale and see uh, no primary colors now this is just one theory of color vision so there happens to also be another one which combined are basically going to make up our theory uh, that is complete about color vision. So this theory is known as the opponent process theory of color vision. And they are basically going to argue that color perception depends on receptors that make opposite responses to three pairs of colors. So you have a red versus green pair, a yellow versus blue pair, and then a black versus white uh, pair. And so uh, one of the ways you can actually experience this is to see exactly um, a after image which is going to show you a visual image that will persist after the stimulus is removed and so if you pay close attention I'm going to show you an example of this take a look at the next slide what you should do is stare at the dot in the center of this picture and you will need to do this for about 30 seconds and once you've done this uh, you, you should probably just pause your video so that way I don't have to make this as long so if you pause your video now and stare at the dot for 30 seconds and then unpause your video once 30 seconds has passed and look at the next picture then you will see exactly what I'm referring to which is the after image which is basically going to help you in understanding the opponent process theory of color vision so here it is now if you're looking at this you should see the after image which is the American flag and of course I'm sure you noticed that from just looking at the previous stimulus but that stimulus is now removed if for some reason you didn't see this you may want to go back and try again and then just give yourself a slight blink and you should see what comes up as a residual image or the after image and uh, this is basically going to conclude the visual system essentials next time I hope you'll join me and we'll take a look at some perceptual processes that will take place thanks and I hope to see you next time